Welcome to this evening's 5 by 15 event. Um, and we are thrilled to be joined by hundreds of people here watching live, as well as many on the catch up, um, as we're joined by Marcus de Sotoy and Roger Highfield to celebrate Marcus's new book, Thinking Better, The Art of the Shortcut. So don't forget that speaker books can be purchased from you and books are um, community and independent bookshop partner. Um, I will put the details in the chat and also make sure to put your all important questions for Marcus and Roger in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screens. And let me quickly introduce our speakers this evening before we get started. Marcus de Soto is Professor of Maths at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of the Royal Society. In 2008, he was appointed as the Simone Chair for the Understanding, Public Understanding of Science, a post that was previously held by Richard Dawkins. And he's widely known for his numerous and varied projects to popularize maths um, from the landmark, uh, the story of maths on BBC, to delivering the Royal Institution Christmas lectures to his writing, books and plays. And we're thrilled to have him back with us again this evening. And we couldn't hope for a better interviewer. Tonight, leading the discussion, we have Roger Highfield, who is science director at the Science Museum Group. He studied chemistry at Oxford University and was the first person to bounce a neutron off a soap bubble. He was the science editor of the Daily Telegraph for two decades and um, editor of The New Scientist between 2008 and 2011. And he's the author of several books, including Super Cooperators and most recently, The Dance of Life, Symmetry Cells and How We Become Human. So tonight we're joined by two brilliant thinkers and communicators, and we're thrilled to have them with us. Um, over to you, Roger, and um, I will disappear into the wings. Thank you so much, Daisy, for that lovely uh, introduction. And um, gosh, I, my paths, uh, my path has crossed with Marcus's for many times. I mean, gosh, Marcus, I think it goes back 20 years to when you wrote a book about um, maths in football, I think, and prime numbers in football. And actually, even in the museum, we, we worked together on the Back Charlie manuscript, The History of Zero, and even, because you're such a Renaissance man, uh, you did this play X and Y in which you played X. So there's just no limit to the sorts of things you're, you, you, you get up to, Marcus. Just tell me, why did you want to focus on shortcuts in particular? What, what, what inspired you? Sorry. Absolutely. I We're off to a flying cardinal, start, everyone. Cardinal sin. Uh, surely after <laughs> so many months of Zoom, you know to switch that. Um, uh, but I'm afraid, you know, be, being a mathematician, these the practical cut, things. It's called a button, okay? I, I know, I know. <laughs> these practical things are always, um, you know, bouncing uh, neutrons off bubbles. That would be far beyond me. But um, uh, anyway, yes. <laughs> Uh, I think there were kind of two things which started me on this journey of writing this book about shortcuts. One was actually a response uh, to an interview that I did with John Harris at The um, Guardian. Uh, the previous book I wrote was about artificial intelligence and creativity called The Creativity Code. And uh, he interviewed me about the book. And, and by the end of the interview, um, he looked so depressed. Um, uh, I said, it, it sounds like there's nothing left for humanity, you know, if it can be creative and write music and novels and, and things like this, you know, what hope is there for us? And um, and I said, I think there's something we've got going for us, which is that humans, we're incredibly lazy and uh, faced with a problem, uh, I think artificial intelligence computers are quite happy just to, to churn on through huge amounts of data analysis, lots of long computations. They just don't get tired. Um, yeah. Whilst for me, I think, you know, if I'm faced with- yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for me, if I'm faced with just kind of an overload of uh, the thing tasks that I'm having to do in order to do my research, um, I very often just think, oh, I, I'm just going to, I, I can't do all this hard work. I want to sit back and find the kind of clever way to think about this problem. So, so my kind of response to John was that well, I think our laziness might be our saving grace because it forces us quite often to, to come up with clever ways to solve a problem. And I, I really felt that my own subject of mathematics, uh, I mean, I chose mathematics as a kid at school as the, the subject I wanted to kind of dedicate my life to, partly because I was a lazy teenager. And my teacher made me realize that 
Um, far from being a subject which is about long, boring calculations, long division and things like that, actually, mathematics is what he used to call the art of the shortcut. It's all the clever ways we've come up with over the last kind of 5,000 years uh, of thinking about uh, sort of uh, problems we're faced with, coming up with clever ways to think about them. So um, it, I thought, that's great. I'm going to write a book which is sort of... Um, uh, a companion to the artificial intelligence book. Yeah, artificial intelligence is very good at doing some things, but humans, we are actually very good at others. And coming up with these clever shortcuts um, it, it, it is what I think humans are very good at. Um, I love this this link with, with laziness, um, Marcus. I hope you're still there because I think you've frozen on my screen, but hopefully you're, you're still there because, um, you know, we've had some amazing mathematicians in the museum, people like Andrew Wiles and Tim Gowers. And I sort of wish that we'd ask them if there was a correlation between sloth and propensity to do mathematics. So Marcus, do you think you've, you've proved with this book that, that laziness is good? Uh, Marcus. There you go. I seem to be committing all the cardinal sins of uh, Zoom tonight. I, I, I'm not sure where I went there. Um, a shortcut to some other um, side of the universe. So uh, I, I'm not sure when I cut out there. Um, you'll have to... Uh, I, let, I, what I, I was really fired up by your link with, with laziness and the fact you were a lazy te uh, teenager and so on and so forth. And in fact, we've had some huge mathematicians in, in the museum, people like Tim uh, Gowers and Andrew Wiles. And I wish I'd asked them whether there's a connection between sloth and propensity to do mathematics. And does that mean, does this imply, Marcus, that, that laziness is good and we should be aspired to be, to be lazy? Or am I carrying it a bit too far there? No, I think oh. that, um, laziness uh, is actually rather looked down on because people, I, I think that kind of the authority wants to keep us in our place because laziness often pushes us to, to think of rather disruptive ways to do things. So I, I think generally laziness um, is partly about controlling society uh, you know saying that laziness is a bad thing because I think there are lots of instances of where uh, somebody doesn't want to do hard work I mean take Babe Ruth for example he hated running um, so he much preferred to score home runs which just meant he could wander around the bases and come back to the beginning um, so that was why he became such a, a great hitter and, and there are lots of examples of of people who kind of use uh, their downtime, for example, to make their breakthroughs. Uh, Alan Turing always talked about um, how he was uh, uh, much more creative when he was out running uh, and he would come back yeah. and he would solve problems. So, um, uh, so yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, laziness is not one of the, the, the seven deadly sins. I think it's actually uh, the key to us finding clever ways to do things. So let's focus a bit on your teacher. In fact, we should mention his name. It's Mr. Bailson, wasn't it? Mr. Bailson, yeah, exactly. Which is um, lovely. I mean, I was inspired by my chemistry uh, master at, 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 uh, at school. And it's so important, isn't it, to, you know, they, they play such an amazing role. So thank you, all those teachers out there. But, yes. but he, what was the shortcut? that he showed you that really fired up your interest in all of this? Yeah, it's um, a classic little story of mathematics that any mathematicians out there will, will recognize. It, it was, he told us this story about the young Carl Friedrich Gauss, um, who is actually, he's a companion throughout this book because he's uh, one of the great mathematicians of the 19th century, German mathematician. Uh, and uh, he, he He's somehow, I would say, the master of the shortcuts. I mean, and some people said oh, there's there's this Latin phrase, the princeps mathematicorum. So he was the foremost of mathematicians. I mean, that he he, you know, he, he really was um, the absolutely. The and and this story giant. sort of illustrates that at a, even at a very early age, um, uh, that it was clear that uh, we had a genius on our hands. So the the story goes that the teacher um, in his class, when he was about nine or ten, um, asked the class to add up the numbers from one to a hundred. Uh, and I think he thought, well, this is a task which will take the class a long time to do um, and I'll be able to get 40 winks. Um, and so, but before he'd even set the problem, uh, Gauss had already written down on his chalkboard uh, an answer and, and slammed it down on the desk. Um, and the teacher was kind of outraged at uh, the audacity of this boy. Um, but when he looked down, he saw the correct answer there. Um, and so he, he asked Gauss, well, how did you come to get that answer so quickly? Because 
you know, I, I thought it was going to take you a long time at one plus two plus three plus four. That is the long, boring, hard way to solve that problem. But what Gauss saw was don't start at the beginning of the journey and then try to get to the end. Actually combine the beginning and the end of the journey together. So if you take the first number and the last number, one plus 100 is 101. But two plus 99 is also 101. Three plus 98, 101. So what Gauss had realized is that you pair off the numbers uh, from the beginning and the end of the calculation. You get 50 pairs of 101. So that's uh, the answer is 5,050. Um, and so when my teacher uh, told us this story um, and said, you know, that is what mathematics is about, avoiding the hard work of doing all of that calculation where you're probably going to make lots of mistakes on the way, not get the right answer. It's about coming up with that cunning way to look at the problem. And this is what I'm going to teach you over the years that I, I will be your teacher of mathematics. Um, and I, I immediately fell in love with the subject, I thought that that is the way I want to to approach the world where I think of a clever way and then I just can uh, sit back, um, play football or whatever. Um, so, and I think there's a really interesting quality of this shortcut because suppose the teacher had asked you to add up the numbers from one to a million. Well, yeah. anyone doing that the long way is going to take, an, you know, even longer to get to the solution. But for Gauss, that will work the same way. He can pair them up. Uh, a million plus one uh, will be the, the sum of each of the pairs. And you've got 500,000 of them. So he will get the answer very quickly as well. So that's the charm of these shortcuts. Um, even if you make the problem even more complex, uh, they still get you to the answer very quickly. Well, in Thinking Better, you put together a lovely, charming collection of these different, you know, sorts of shortcuts that mathematics has discovered over the centuries. But you also hint that nature's often found these shortcuts before humans. Just just talk me through that a little bit. Well, it's um, uh, one of our ideas about nature is that it, too, is very lazy and that it often tries to find a uh, the kind of quickest, fastest solution to a problem. So, so very often, uh, one of the shortcuts is to see, well, how does nature do this? Um, uh, one of the kind of illustrations of this is uh, if you take blow a soap bubble, then the bubble tries to find the shape which uses the least amount of energy to contain that volume of air. And this is why it is spherical, because that turns out to be the the shape with the smallest surface area containing that volume and, and surface area is proportional to the energy so uh, nature just tends to it's a bit like the idea of drop a ball down the side of a mountain and it comes into a valley that is the low energy solution so right. time and again uh that that's what nature is doing and and we've exploited that there's um i i went to <clears throat> munich and saw uh, otto fry's um, amazing construction for the Munich Olympics. Um, and he, in fact, used soap bubbles as a shortcut to uh, right. finding the way to, I mean, it looks like a, loads of soap films over these uh, construction. And, and he realized that that would be a very efficient way and a low energy way, and it will mean there's not too much tension um, on the building. Uh, so he, he actually used nature's shortcut as his own shortcut to build that building. In fact, when I did my doctorate, you'll be interested to know, I used to make bubbles out of heavy soap and you got just the same sort of effects, of course. But the, there's a kind of intriguing implication of what you're saying here, that, that nature's mathematical. And I've heard some people like Max Tegmark um, in the States actually say that the, the universe is a, math, is, is a mathematical object. You know, that everything in our world is purely mathematical, including you and me. Um, do you buy into that at all, Marcus? Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. And in fact, you see, uh, this relates to a book I wrote a couple of books ago called What We Cannot Know. And I think one of the big challenges uh, out there is, um, you know, why is the universe the way it is? Why um, is there something rather than nothing? What, what created this whole universe? Um, and you know, some people will come up with the idea of, oh, there's a God that created it, but then you get this infinite regress because, um, you know, who created God? Um, uh, so I think that what you need to look for to answer that kind of problem is something which is outside of time. And I, my belief is that mathematics is something which, you know, didn't have a moment of creation. It is a, uh, it is outside of time. So I think it is a very good candidate in a way for 
a creator for being the reason that things are created um because uh, we are I think Max Tegmark is kind of right in, in suggesting that maybe we're a physicalized piece of mathematics, which doesn't mean that can't, couldn't have been another way. I mean, I think there are, what, what I love about mathematics uh, is that uh, we're quite happy to um, consider sort of multiple different versions of our universe. Um, I think a physicist will be after trying to describe what our universe is like. And if there's a model yeah. which doesn't fit the experiments that gets thrown out. But for, for me as a mathematician, I'm, I'm, I'm quite open to the kind of idea of a, a multiverse. So I'm quite interested in uh, geometries which are um, maybe hyperbolic or Euclidean or non-Euclidean. And one of those will describe our universe. But I'm interested in all of those geometries. Um, uh, and, and so what I think we're seeing is probably our, our universe is one physicalized version of some of our equations of mathematics. Um, and quite possibly there are other universes which are physicalizing the mathematics in, in different ways. Um, so, and I think that's the reason, as you say, why do we just keep on finding mathematics at the bottom of everything? For example, quarks. I mean, quarks are basically just a little piece of mathematics. Um, uh, nobody's ever seen a quark in isolation. Uh, uh, and that that you know everything seems to be made out of bits of maths um but, so but marcus this has got a sort of implication does this mean that actually you mathematicians you're not creative people at all you know you've all got kind of um oh. in effect pith helmets and you're just you're just discovering stuff that's already out there well that oh, gosh we that's a very deep philosophical <laughs> argument that we mathematicians <laughs> have amongst ourselves uh very often because um yeah i i think there is a uh, a real feeling when you're a mathematician of um, being creative, but also an element of discovery. So, um, yeah. you know, uh, the things that I've discovered in my own mathematics, um, uh, I, I really do feel that I had to use my imagination, my intuition, sort of uh, put these ideas together. But once they're there, there's a feeling like, well, gosh, but that was always out there for us yeah. to discover. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you see this because uh, when we take non-Euclidean geometry, it was discovered by three people, including my hero Gauss, um, around the same time. Um, but I sort of sometimes compare it to uh, the idea of um, a composer who has certain notes on the piano, for example. And so there's a selection of things out there, but it's how you put those notes right. together. Uh, I mean, so the creativity of the mathematician is, I'm not trying to prove all the true statements about numbers mm. and geometry, because a lot of them are very boring. What I'm trying to do is pull out and here is where the creativity, I think, occurs. I'm trying to pull out um, the, the combinations of mathematical ideas that actually tell an interesting story that um, yeah. stimulate my audience. And so I think the creativity is about the choices that you make. Uh, and there, I think a, a mathematician has more choices available than, to them than the scientist, because the scientist is more bound um, by the, the confines of experiment of, of the actual universe we're in, whilst I have freedom to kind of put ideas together, which if they surprise you and take you somewhere new, um, uh, you'll 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 buy into that, even though it may not be a description of our physical universe. We, we could go off down another very deep rabbit hole about some modern physical theory isn't even experimentally verifiable. So it's kind of it's getting very murky indeed. But let's obviously let's go back to thinking better and actually I should say also to the audience if you've got questions please put them uh please bombard us with some questions because we're going to have some time at the end to to put them to to Marcus um but you you're 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 looking um in thinking better at different kinds of shortcut and um you know we're in a world of a kind of incredibly expanding data sphere uh, where we're all leaving kind of vast trails of data through our smartphones and web use and so on. And there's a great um, editorial in the latest issue of Nature by Paul Nurse, who's complaining um, about how data is triumphing over understanding. And he quotes Sidney Brenner, that we're drowning in a sea of data and starving for knowledge. So how can maths help us cut through that, that problem? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's very easy. I, I do think that there's um, uh, 
too much emphasis on on data and the patterns inside there and we're we're forgetting to do the analytics side yeah. um, uh, so I, I totally uh, agree with Paul Nurse on, on that that we need to be very careful about not sending things too far the other way um, and in, in some ways we have very uh, clever shortcuts for understanding in, in this kind of huge uh, wealth of data um, what is really going on um, I think one of my favorite examples um, were, relates to a an advert I used to watch as a kid, um, which said eight out of 10 cats prefer whiskers. Um, <laughs> and I was like, well, I, I don't remember our cat ever being asked about what it liked, to, uh, it's cat food. Um, and I, I just wondered, you know, how many cats did they actually ask to be able to be confident about that? I mean- uh, Remind me, Marcus, how, roughly how many cats are there out there to be asked? That's a factoid I don't really know. In the UK, we have 7 million cats. 7 million cats. Seven, so, you know, how- how can you be confident that eight out of 10 cats uh, prefer whiskers if you've got 7 million? It turns out that you only need to ask 250 cats to be, wow. you know, 19 out of 20 times the sample you will take will be within 5% of um, the actual true value of, of the how many cats like whiskers. That is a... I mean, I was quite shocked when I learned that for the first time at university, that such a small sample size can give you that kind of insight into uh, the preferences of 7 million cats. Um, so I think that's very powerful to know, you know, how much information do I need in order to be able to be have a certain yeah. level of confidence? And you know, that that is um, it comes up all over the place, certainly in, in science it does, and, and particularly in artificial intelligence at the moment. You know, um, we're having to kind of make an assessment about um, how much data do I need to give uh, a machine learning algorithm uh, before it's it can be let loose uh, in the world to yeah. make decisions about things. Um, so for example, vision recognition software, um, how many pictures of cats will it need in order to be able to learn the difference between a cat and a dog? Um, so these kind of considerations are, are, are really important, as you say, in this incredibly data rich world um, in, in knowing you know how how much data do I need? Um, how much will be too little, and I will get um, uh, you know not good answers back? How much is too much, and I've over uh, kind of um, determined the algorithm? So so finding that sweet spot, mathematics is very good at telling you um, how much you're going to need. And also, it, it's it's got to um, you've got to curate the data quite carefully because we've got lots of examples of machine learning systems that were trained on one set. Typically oh, yes. on on people that look like you and me, and when pointed at the other, you know, vast number of people on the planet, came up with all sorts of misclassifications and so on. So presumably, um, there must be some insights there that, that that mathematical shortcuts can give us into how, what spread of data types and how to yes. create them and so on. Yeah, I think that's uh, absolutely right. And and I think you, uh, one of the shortcuts I talk about is um, uh, using the crowd as a shortcut. I mean, this idea of wisdom of the crowd, um, something actually, you know, uh, citizen science projects, uh, which we have some wonderful ones in Oxford and you've done some wonderful ones at the Science Museum. I mean, tapping into uh, the, the the insights of a lot of people to gather that information. And again, it's, it's kind of crucial uh, to to know what sort of questions are susceptible to the wisdom yeah. of the crowd because not all of them are um and again one of the things you there are kind of various um categories you need that you as you say you need a a, a good spread of different opinions you don't want to uh, have kind of um focused opinions um so for example uh, uh participatory budgeting is an interesting idea of the wisdom of the crowd um which a couple of governments have tried out that yeah let's get society to try and determine our budgets um the first time they did this um they invited people to come and take part um this failed completely because the only people who signed up were those who had a bee in their bonnet about something right. um, um and, and so when it really worked i think in iceland um they actually made it uh, kind of like jury service so they just sent out letters randomly and, and it was then that actually the thing worked well because people were obliged to come and right. they weren't kind of vested interests um uh but i think that that's interesting the, the wisdom of the crowd i mean i talk about 
an interesting way the crowd is using shortcuts uh, for example um, uh, desire lines which are these things in you know if you if you go to your local park um, i mean i see you go to greenwich park uh, of a morning i do, right I do my morning tweet every day i i, I always enjoy your morning tweet um <laughs> Uh, but, you know, in my park, there are some really interesting routes where, you know, people have just taken the shortcut uh, and they've there's a grass. Uh, the grass has been worn out by people going yeah. across the path. Now, these are called desire paths and, and they're they're kind of useful ways for a, a, a town planner to actually uh, lay down paths. You know, let the public tell us um, what paths they want. And, and those those are actually the ones that they then can lay down. So a lot of architects, Rem Coolhouse used that in the design of a, um, paths at a university in the, U in, in the US, for example. Well, that brings me nicely on to the, the next point. I mean, I love the idea that you're motivated by being lazy. I'm kind of getting a slight sort of cognitive dissonance there. But what's going, going back to your paths of desire, what's the difference between a shortcut and cutting corners, or I guess how much simplification is too much? Uh, I think this is really key. And I, I try to make a point very early on that um, what I'm after is uh, shortcuts, which get me to the right answer. And, and cutting corners generally means, you know, your house is going to fall down after a while if you cut corners. So, um, uh, but as you say, some of these shortcuts are, are about throwing away information. Um, mm. and, and that is often key in mathematics. I mean, we're very good. Uh, uh, it's one of our skills is looking at a problem and realizing all of these other things are totally unimportant and pulling out the essence of the problem. I mean, so for example, uh, topology, which is our bendy sheet geometry, um, which doesn't matter about distances in, in a shape, um, is a classic way of throwing away information um, that isn't important. So, yeah. you know, the like, classic is like, like, like the tube map in London, I guess. Exactly. Or the, yeah. the London Underground map is a perfect example of uh, you, all you matter, all that matters is how to get from one place to another. You don't quite really mind about the distances. And so that's a good uh, kind of shortcut. You've thrown away information which is unimportant and i think one of the uh, shortcuts i talk about in the book um is the power of a very good diagram uh, and i think diagrams by their nature are um uh, trying to get to the essence of, of a problem throw away what's unimportant i mean the, the there's a beautiful story of um uh, crick and watson trying to draw a diagram for their nature paper um of the what their discovery of the structure of dna and they just yeah. kept on wanting to put too much information on there about the other things they discovered um and it just just didn't communicate um and eventually uh crick asked his wife odile who was uh, an artist um you know, you know we're just not really communicating the essence of our discovery. And, and so she then just threw away all the extraneous information and drew this beautiful uh, double helix, which is the one that appeared in, in the nature paper. Uh, and it, that, that was a perfect, just enough information to communicate the, the extraordinary breakthrough. And I suppose it's no accident that there are mathematicians out there. And I'm thinking of Roger Penrose, who comes yeah. from a distinguished artistic family. And I love it when Roger gives a presentation uh, in the old days, he'd use a transparency and he'd do these hand drawings of geometries uh, for his twister theory or whatever it was. And they were actually, you know, I wish I'd sort of, um, you know, begged for him to give me a couple of copies because I, I put them up on my on my living room wall. You know, they're kind of. Yeah, I think it's I, and this is. You know, he he does these little uh, uh, twister diagrams and they are absolutely beautiful and, and they relate actually some diagrams that probably people uh, um, will have seen before, which are, are these Feynman diagrams. Uh, uh, and Feynman diagrams are how um, uh, uh, physicists understand how fundamental particles interact with each other. But what those diagrams are actually doing is um, in, in diagrammatic form, representing uh, very complex integrals and mathematical equations, which uh, at the time people were finding very hard to navigate because the, the complexity of the language. And, and Feynman's kind of great insight was, uh, no, but these diagrams are doing absolutely what these equations are doing, but somehow they're much easier to, to manipulate. And uh, you can sort of think of um, uh, Roger's um, uh, twister diagrams as kind of versions of that. Um, and, and so th those have been absolutely fundamental in helping people to understand uh, how fundamental particles uh, actually interact with each other. 
So of all these wonderful shortcuts um, you've got in thinking better, what is your favorite shortcut? Oh gosh, that's, uh, that's a difficult question. Uh, I, I think one of my favorites um, relates to another little fairy tale we get told um, as mathematicians, um, which is uh, about one of the other great mathematicians of, of the 18th, 19th century, which is Leonard Euler. Um, Euler was uh, shown this kind of problem about a I town. I you remember even Gauss thought that Euler was a bit of a rock star, didn't he? He said, yeah, read Euler. He is the master of us all, uh, I think he said. <laughs> um, uh, there was this uh, town in uh, northern, well, Germany didn't exist, but uh, Prussia, I guess, uh, Königsberg, um, which has two rivers running into the, the town. And then there's an island in the middle, and then the river runs out to, to the, um, the Baltic Sea. And there were seven bridges uh, crossing the rivers. And it was kind of Sunday afternoon uh, puzzle for these residents of Königsberg to try and find, um, uh, could they cross these seven bridges um, once and once only and come back to the beginning? Um, and every time they tried, um, they, there just always was one bridge left over, but they, they always thought, well, maybe there's another way to do this. So many different combinations of uh, ways to cross these bridges. Maybe we just haven't found the one that does it. Um, but then when Euler took this uh, problem, um, he first of all turned it into a bit like the um, uh, London Underground map. He, he drew just a picture um, which sort of consisted of the, the all the regions of land have been condensed into points. And then he drew lines between the points if there was a bridge connecting those bits of land. And then he realized, the task was actually the same as drawing this little picture um, with your pen, but uh, running over each line once, but never taking your pen off the paper. And then he realized, oh, hold on, uh, whenever I go into a, a point, I have to come out on a separate line. So that means there's basically each point has to have an even number of lines coming in and out of it. Um, so when he looked at the little diagram of the bridges of Königsberg, um, there were four dots and every dot had an odd number of lines coming out of it. So he said, well, this is impossible because um, you, you, you've you got to have mostly even numbers because, right. okay, the, there are two places, the beginning and the end can have an odd number, but that's a maximum of two. That's such a beautiful, simple and elegant insight, isn't it? It, it is. And what's so beautiful about it is that, you know, uh, you can do this now at home if you want. Um, just draw an incredibly complicated sort of uh, London underground map, lots of points, stations, lots of lines. And to know whether you can make that picture, even if you have like a hundred dots and, and, and a thousand lines joined, joining them. All you need to do is to make sure that there are a, a, a maximum of two dots with an odd number coming out. Um, if there are two dots with an odd number, you know that you can draw that picture without taking your pen off the paper. Um, but if there are more than that, you, you know it's impossible. Um, so actually, I, I talked to somebody when I was down in Bristol recently, and uh, they told me that there are something like 45 bridges crossing the, the rivers that run through Bristol. And somebody had analyzed these 45 bridges using Euler's shortcut and, and said, yeah, this is possible. And then he set out and it took him, I think, over a, a day um, to, to cross <laughs> all the bridges. But he, he, he made sure it was actually possible. Now, there's actually a follow up to this story because I went I, I so fell in love with this story that I thought I want to go and visit Königsberg which is modern day Kaliningrad, a um, uh, little Rus Russian ex exclave. Um, I mean, it's surrounded by other countries. There are still seven bridges, but they're in a different configuration because uh, uh -oh. the allies bombed it during the second world war. These new seven bridges, you can now cross because when you draw the diagram, there are only two places with an odd number. So, so I very nerdily made a journey uh, around Kaliningrad, uh, crossing all of the seven bridges. Some Pilgrimage of the old ones- Euler. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so in the in the book, you've you've um, you've also you know gone outside your territory and you've consulted other people to see whether there's any analogy between uh, the way other professionals think and the mathematicians think. And you talk to your wife Shani, who's a psychologist, and Michael Polanyi, this philosopher, and Brent Hoberman, the uh, the last minute dot com person, who seemed if I read it right to be advocating law breaking. Um, but just, just tell me um, how their shortcuts kind of mapped onto what you've learned from mathematics. Yeah, well, I was very, uh, exactly. I was very intrigued to see whether uh, in other professions they had shortcuts and were they ones that I would recognize from my own suite of mathematical shortcuts. So for example, actually, uh, 
Brent's shortcut, which was kind of, you know, flying close to the law. Uh, I mean, they, 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 with lastminute.com, they were sweeping data uh, and, and breaking some law about computer data at the time. Um, and, and I realized actually that's quite close to a shortcut that we made in mathematics because one of the great shortcuts was coming up with a new number called the square root of minus one, imaginary numbers. That was kind of breaking the law. That up to that point, we said every number when you square it is positive. Um, and then somebody had the great idea. Well, yeah, but what if you let in one of these kind of curious yeah. new numbers? And that has become an incredible shortcut uh, using the square root of minus one. I mean, literally, um, if you want to land uh, airplanes, the calculations that you have to do using radar in the past with the computers that we had, the plane would have crashed by the time you'd finished the calculation if you didn't use imaginary numbers. So imaginary numbers are a shortcut to being able to do these calculations very quickly um, and be able to land the plane safely. Um, I'm, I'm not sure people in, in, a, in a jet are going to be reassured by the knowledge that imaginary numbers are helping to land this plane right now, but it's a great... <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Um, but one of the other interesting insights by talking to other people was actually finding professions where there were no shortcuts. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I talked to Natalie Klein, uh, international cellist. Um, I've been trying to learn the cellos just down here in my office. Um, and I was really keen. Is, are there any shortcuts you can give me uh, to being able to play, you know, the Bach suites uh, without having to do like years and years of practice? And, and she said, well, basically, no. And the, the challenge here is that when you're uh, practicing the cello, you're, you're actually having to physically change your body. I mean, it's a bit like becoming an athlete. How could you shortcut yeah. becoming a, you know, a hundred meter gold medal winner? I mean, yeah, drugs maybe, but I think it's very hard to avoid actually having to do the hard work. And, and I think whenever there was a, um, the limitations of actually having to kind of change your body, that is, is very often something which there isn't a shortcut. So, so I think, you know, sometimes you do have to put in the 10,000 hours in order to be able to um, achieve that. But even with music, actually, one of the shortcuts that Natalie did tap into, which I did recognize, was the idea of patterns. So she will often see a pattern of notes and, and, and see that as one unit rather than having to reach each note individually. And that, for me, finding a pattern is very often an incredibly good shortcut to not having to look at all of the numbers individually, but the pattern tells me just exactly what's gonna happen next. So, um, so there were, again, there were some uh, interesting connections there. So, Marcus, I think let's just have one more question and then let's um, open it up to, and I've just started looking at the, the audience questions. There's quite a few in there. Um, let, let's look at it around the other way, um, which is, you know, are there times when you want to go the long way? And um, you, I know you talked to the wonderful Robert McFarlane, who's such a poetic um, writer about walking and thinking. Um, you know, and his books are a kind of eulogy to thinking on the hoof and the satisfaction that brings. How does that map uh, onto yeah. mathematical practices? Well, I, I think the point here is actually to go back to Aristotle's uh, division between two sorts of work. Um, so uh, he defines praxis as uh, doing work for the, for the love of it, for the sake of it, um, and poesis as doing work to uh, realise uh, an objective. Uh, and I think that my shortcuts, yeah, sometimes I, I love the work that I do. Uh, and I, I, I enjoy spending the time thinking about mathematical problems. Uh, I mean, uh, so in a, in a weird way, although I was a lazy teenager, actually, I quite enjoy the hard work of um, coming up with the shortcuts uh, and things. But my, my feeling is my book is trying to uh, avoid you doing the work you don't want to do to yeah. enable you to do the work that you do want to do. So for example, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a, I love walking as well. And uh, um, I remember going out with my son one day, uh, we, we were doing a walk up in the Lake District. And uh, after about 30 minutes, he saw uh, like a, a path back down to the house that we'd rented. And he said, Dad, there's a shortcut back to the beginning. And, and it kind of revealed to me, yo, we're going from A to A. And the point is to spend six hours out walking and not to do this shortcut. Um, so my feeling is these shortcuts are trying to, I didn't want to walk all the way up to uh, the Lake District. So I will take the shortcut, which will get me the, to, to, um, up to the north of England. I, I will take the, the fast train uh, to get there. Um, 
so these shortcuts are trying to get rid of the work you don't want to do and leave you with praxis the work that you do want to right. do um you know i think karl marx said the highest form of communism is when we actually want to do the work that we do and do you i mean i just one last follow-up and then i'll go to the the questions but um i seem to remember you you were talking about conjectures being kind of long cuts when you intuit a solution like Fermat did, um, or in fact, the, the amazing Ramanujan, who just seemed to, uh, he thought through some divine spiritual means he could intuit the answers to things. But then you've got a devil of a problem figuring, figuring out, it's like you can see a distant mountain peak, but then you've got to figure out a way to get to that peak in effect. Yes, and that, that is... That, in a sense, is what I'm uh, kind of faced with every day. I mean, I have conjectures that I'm working on. And, and at the moment, I, I'm sitting in front of this huge mountain and I can't find a way to get to uh, the kind of destination on the other side of this mountain. And, and very often what I'm doing in my mathematical research is trying to find the sneaky tunnel that might get me to the other side or um, some interesting way to lift myself out of um, uh, the, the terrain that I'm in and, and move me to completely different, um, you know, like a wormhole or something. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, conjectures are, are those who've got an insight into something far distant and, and, but then the task is trying to find that path. And, and the interesting thing is sometimes um, that, sometimes in order to find, a shortcut you need to go on a detour um and i think we found that with fermat's last theorem that um yeah. uh you, you know i don't think fermat really did have a proof that didn't fit in the margin <laughs> um uh, uh <laughs> but um it, it take took us on an a, an extraordinary journey and sometimes you know i think that was a bit like uh robert mcfarlane's um uh walks because that although it was quite a long journey 350 yeah. years and some extraordinary uh places we visited on the way i think the joy of the journey um, justified uh, the long cut in that case. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a wonderful story um, of Andrew Wiles. Um, now, let me go to the questions now. Um, let, let me take one from Nels, who says, could you speak on slime molds, shortcuts and mathematics? And I've, I've got this dim recollection, Marcus, of what this is talking about, where you've got a maze. Slime molds are these funny multicellular organisms, and they can figure out the fastest way through a maze to a bit of food, can't they? Yes, yes. yes. It's very interesting. This again, I think, goes back to the way that nature um, is often very good at finding uh, solutions. So, um, uh, for example, uh, um, there was an experiment that was done with slime mold where they put um, food um, in uh, the locations corresponding to uh, uh, stations um, in, in Tokyo and, and, and the larger area of Tokyo and, and ask the slime molds to, to find the, the best way to connect uh, those stations. Um, so it sort of started exploring uh, and it would strengthen paths. I mean, this is sort of what's happening. And uh, you find this also um, with uh, ants working all together that uh, they lay pheromone paths uh, down and, and they get strengthened. Uh, so it's, it's almost like it's trying lots of different uh, paths uh, and, and the successful ones get strengthened. Um, and actually the, the slime mold came up uh, so it's good at finding mazes, but it also came up with the the actual way that the um, network of trains connecting those stations um, had been laid down by the uh, the Tokyo Transport Authority. So, um, but it also relates another uh, version of this, which is interesting, is that um, you know, for example, light um, also is very good at finding the shortest path between mm. two places, and so um, when you, uh, for example, if you have two different mediums, water and air. The, the light will will find this kind of curious path, not the straight line, but it will go uh, through the medium where it's uh, fastest first and then a shorter path through the slow one. Um, and we've often asked, you know, how does light know to, to take that path? And what we believe is that we need to kind of have the idea of quantum physics where actually it tries all paths, but it collapses into the most efficient, lazy path, the shortest path. Um, and it's a little bit like the same thing is happening with the slime mold and, um, and the ants. They're sort of trying multiple paths, but they sort of almost like collapse into the most efficient path. I think before we blow people's minds with quantum thinking, let, let's go to another question which actually relates to your wonderful teacher, Mr. Belson, um, 
It's called the Rapid Transition Alliance here. Do you think there are people who could be great at maths, but have never discovered it because of terrible maths teaching or bad learning experience? How can we encourage more people, and particular women and girls, to get into the subject? Yeah, I think one of the difficulties with mathematics is that um, it, it's very much building a pyramid. Um, and if you have one bad year um, and, and a sort of faulty layer in this pyramid that you're building, it's, it's very hard to build anything on top of that. So I think whilst if you're learning history, if you have a bad teacher one year, you can kind of recover um, quite easily the, the, the following year if you get somebody who inspires you again. So, so I think one of the difficulties is that it's it's a very sort of accumulative subject in, in that way. So one suggestion would be if you don't get a year, redo the year. And when we're, we're very against that in the UK. Um, but the other thing I think is um, we're sometimes a little bit too obsessed with building this uh, pyramid, you know, layer by layer and not showing people the, the view from the top. Yeah. Uh, and my feeling is that, uh, and this is often what I try to do with my books, is um, to give people um, a, a kind of sense of the magic, the story, the, the wonderful mathematical music that you can make, even though you might not know all the details of how to, to, to recreate it or, 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 or uh, make the thing yourself. So um, I've always actually believed that we should have the same way that English has two GCSEs, English language and English literature, that we should actually have two mathematical GCSEs. People might say that's a terrible idea, but um, but my idea would be we've already got the kind of maths language, which is all the kind of rather technical, boring stuff. But what we need is the maths literature and the kind of big stories, the idea of infinity, of prime numbers, Fibonacci numbers or topology, four-dimensional yeah. geometry, how that helps to create uh, wormholes in the films that we see interstellar or something like that um I, I think that we're missing out on on telling the wonderful stories and i think i was very lucky with mr Bailson uh that that he sort of uh, took the time and i guess yeah. I, you know we were in a different period there but, where but do you think marcus there could be people who've got algebraic brains and they've got people who've got geometric brains and oh and, yes you know so, so it could be that if people think visually and they're taught in a classical way, uh, we, we could be wasting all that amazing talent by not nurturing it the right way. Yeah, so I think this is why we need to find multiple ways to, to give people access into mathematics. And maybe, you know, you're, you're very musical. And if you can tap into showing where the mathematics is in that music, it will just open up uh, the world of mathematics for you as a, as a powerful tool. And I think it's, it's interesting because we talked about Roger Penrose and his very visual way of looking at problems. Um, I do think that mathematicians divide into two camps. One is the, the, the people who consider problems very visually but i'm actually somebody who considers problems very linguistically so i yeah. love trying to make you know my area of research is symmetry which at first sight looks very visual um but actually what i do is to take those symmetrical objects and turn it turn it into language a kind of algebra and, and that actually gives me access and that's my shortcut changing the language and suddenly i'm able right. to make shapes uh in high dimensions that you'll never be able to see. So, um, so I do think people have different ways uh, uh, of approaching mathematics, you know, uh, at research level and, and and probably at school level as well. We need to find different ways to tell these stories to to give people um, the the chance to use their particular yeah. way of looking at the world. Uh, lots more questions pouring in here. Um, Great. There's one here from an anonymous attendee. Um, which I rather like. Uh, what about dating algorithms? How do shortcuts come into play? There we are. What about, uh, you know, a shortcut to get the ideal date? <laughs> uh, well, that's very interesting because it, it relates to one of the uh, data shortcuts um, because one of the challenges, of course, when trying to find a, a kind of mate for life is that, you know, you go out with your first girlfriend or boyfriend and and you think they're amazing and then but you think well but but maybe there are better things out there and um so you know that that great worry about how, you know how many people do i need to <laughs> date before i got a good sense of yeah i've, I've got the, the best partner in life and actually mathematics can help you with that um there's uh, top of the kind of mathematical charts of numbers is a number pi, but the kind of number two that comes in is a number e, which is starts 2.7 and then it goes off 
like pi never repeating itself infinite decimal. But this number turns out to be the key to dating uh, and, and knowing when to commit. Um, so uh, if you take one over E, which is about uh, 37%, 0.37. take it E stands for ero it stands for erogenous or something like that. <laughs> Don't tell me it's something boring <laughs> like Euler, but anyway. <laughs> I think it's actually named after Euler because yeah. Euler was, um, so, um, uh, yeah, not erogenous, no. Um, uh, Sorry, terrible joke, forgive me. Yes, Mark. terrible from you, uh, <laughs> E. Roger. Um, uh, uh, so, um, but it turns out you need to consider, it, it, and, and this actually applies to a lot of situations where, you know, you've got a certain, if you're playing deal or no deal, for example, how many boxes should you open right. before you make a commitment? And it turns out, um, suppose you don't know what's in the boxes at all. You know, how do you know what's out there? You need to consider 37%, one over E of the proportion, and then commit to the best thing you see that beats all the things you've seen up to that point. That gives you a, a one in three chance of achieving the best that is out there. Um, so yeah, if, if you want more details, look in the book, but uh, that's my, my kind of uh, advice of a shortcut to find the best mate in life. So another don't anonymous. tell them that you've done your calculations in order to find. Uh, because... Yes, I mean it makes it you're 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 squashing the romance out of life here, Marcus. Come yes, on. yes. Don't show you're working out afterwards. <laughs> yeah. So what about the most useful mathematical shortcut in history? Someone asked. Well, I think it sort of relates to the nature one because I would say that um, our invention of calculus, uh, Newton's and Leibniz's uh, tool that they introduced. In a way, you know, how does nature find these efficient solutions? Um, the, 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 how does light find the, the, the point to, to find the fastest way from A to B um, if it's going through two medium? Um, uh, actually, what we did to kind of understand how nature is working and finding these, these best solutions, what's the, the, what, the, the way the, um, the soap film forms, um, is this idea of calculus. It is an incredibly powerful mm. tool to be able to find, say, um, the thing which maximizes your profits, for example, or minimizes the amount of energy in a, in a building. Um, it was a tool that enabled us to understand a world in flux, a world that is moving and changing, accelerating, decelerating, um, uh, with so many different variables. Uh, to, to understand that world, I think, the shortcut of calculus just means that um, you're able to, to pull out the solution without having to try all the different possibilities. So, you know, for example, um, if you're trying to make a, a roller coaster, one of the stories I tell in the book, um, what's the, 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 the path that will get you from A to B the fastest possible? Um, and calculus was used by some uh, contemporaries of Newton and Leibniz to answer that problem. And it's a very curious curve. Um, you might think maybe it's a quadratic down to B, but actually it's one that goes down below um, the destination and pulls up again. I mean, a lot of science museums have this um, uh, demonstration where they've got three different sort of curves and, and it's kind of rather unexpected curve, which gets you the ball from A to B right. quickest. Um, and, and calculus was the, the shortcut that found us that solution. So I, I, I probably nominate calculus as um, an amazing shortcut for, uh, uh, for finding efficient solutions, for example. So thanks to Leibniz, or was it Newton, or we'll never know, will we, I guess, but- um, Or so even the Indians, ah, yes, yes, in that, Carolina. Yes, I, I should say we, we were at the Jaipur Literature Festival more than a year ago, and actually, the more you find out about um, mathematics uh, in India hundreds and hundreds of years ago, the more amazing uh, it is. I, I think we'll have to rewrite quite a few mathematics books, won't we? Yeah. Traditional histories. So John Redar, some shortcuts are found by mapping a problem to a different area of mathematics. Do you think there'll be some insightful shortcuts we haven't found yet to some of the most famous mathematical proofs and unsolved conjectures? Yeah, I, I, and I talk about this. I have a, a chapter dedicated to, to kind of language and the ability of changing the language um, uh, to, to be able to find the shortcut. And I, actually, I give a, a little um, game that becomes, uh, it, at first, I looks very difficult to play. Um, it's called 15. You have the numbers from one to nine, and you take it in turn to take numbers, and you have to get three numbers, which ha add up to 15, um, three and exactly three. And, and so when you play this game against somebody else, you've got to try and watch what they're doing. Have they got a number that they're aiming for? Um, and it's quite difficult to play that. 
But if you change the game into uh, something completely different, if you take a magic square with the numbers one to nine, the, this is a square where the diagonals, the sums, uh, the diagonals, the rows and the columns all add up to 15, you realize the game that you're playing is actually noughts and crosses. And noughts and crosses is easy for people to play. So that's a nice example where a, a game at first sight looks very difficult because right. it's hard to keep track of the combinations. If you change it into another game, noughts and crosses, it becomes almost trivial. Noughts and crosses on a magic square is, is the game that you're playing. But I think you're absolutely right that, you know, in a way, Fermat's last theorem played that trick because uh, the great insight we had, which Wiles picked up on, was um, if there is a solution to this, uh, these equations of Fermat, um, then it means you can make an object in a completely different area of mathematics called elliptic curves. Um, and this elliptic curve would have to have special properties. So we actually left Fermat's equations uh, behind and then concentrated on this kind of more geometric area of elliptic curves. And, and that was the breakthrough. We changed the right. language and, and we made the breakthrough. So I'm gonna ask you two more questions. One, one's Slightly um, straightforward one, but someone's itching to know. Diana knows. Uh, Diana asks, "Where did you get that top from?" I want one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is quite it's, snazzy. Uh, it, it is a snazzy. Uh, it, it's actually a Paul Smith T-shirt, um, which was uh, ridiculously expensive, um, but it was my treat during lockdown, given that I was having to uh, appear um, in my office uh, rather too many times. So um, I, I probably uh, I, I, had, I actually checked whether the previous times I've been on five by 15 that I didn't wear this T-shirt. So it's the it's its first. Outing. I think Paul Smith is watching this, Marcus, and you get a kind well, of. I'm, 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 of yeah. I'm very impressed that Paul Smith uh, enjoys his numbers. <laughs> and very last uh, question before we go back to Daisy, rather tough one, and I think impossible to answer. What about a shortcut to select a life path from many options? Um, how can we, here we are, you know, young people facing lots of potential careers. Is there anything that maths can offer them to help, help crack this difficult problem? Probably the biggest one we're all gonna face. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, really tricky because in in some way what you want to do is uh what that slime mold is doing and trying all the different paths and and then just settle on the one and, and we don't have that opportunity but I, I think actually um what i would say is that you need to go back to that aristotle the idea of you know um don't do work for um or trying to arrive just at the destination you know maybe it's uh money that you want or prestige uh, that's not work that you're going to uh, you know that's the work you want to shortcut and and i think what you want to find is that the praxis sort of work the work that you don't mind spending um you know years dedicating your time to and i, I think in my in funny way i started mathematics because i was lazy but i've ended up actually doing mathematics because i enjoy the challenges and and the hard work and um uh and and shortcuts actually the the kind of paradox is that very often you need a lot of hard work to find the shortcut well marcus look, i absolutely loved reading thinking better and thank you being for being such a brilliant uh, guest and thank you to all those people who ask questions and and, I, and apologies to there are many more out there i should have asked but there just wasn't the time um so back to daisy Thank you both so much. That was such a wonderful um, hour spent in the presence of two brilliant, brilliant um, thinkers and communicators. Roger with your amazing backdrop and, and Marcus with your incredible t-shirt. And um, it was a, a fantastic uh, lecture also for lazy people like me to appreciate how maths can, can further help us to be more lazy. But it was full of humor and insight from slime molds to maps to dating. Um, it really has been a fantastic hour and thinking better, the art of the shortcut is out now. So I hope that everybody will pick up a copy and, um, and get a copy straight away. So um, for now, it's thank you very, very much. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you all for your brilliant questions. And we will see you again very, very soon. Good night.